has been I did three uh, things, uh, two things in the States and one in Graz in Austria, which was a summer school. Uh, in the meantime, I had to uh, we, we we developed the project for the harbor development in Düsseldorf, which I will show tonight, and completed the Vitra Power Station. And did two urban uh, studies, one for uh, the Cologne Harbor and one which is for the um, the redevelopment of Madrid. And but in the last six months, uh, we had on a series of projects which were some of commissions, some competitions, three of which I cannot show. One is on the wraps and two are competitions which I cannot uh, reveal. Uh, one of which is the Cardiff Bay Opera House, which I, can, I cannot show. So this is a kind of a, um, kind of a, like an uh, archaeology in reverse of all the three-dimensional studies of some of these projects which were done um, in the office in the last uh, you know, three, five, four, five months. I start with the the the, the Copenhagen um, concert hall, and just to, to go back to the idea, the space which was uh, Im imposed or implied was that it is a box, uh, a given kind of uh, virtual box, and uh, our notion was that to kind of make out, out of this this kind of uh, box which was had to be like a rock, and uh, chiseled out to make these. Um, concert halls. Uh, the, the Cardiff Bay one is not the same at all. Just in case, you think. The other one is a very kind of strange competition, a very interesting one in, um, uh, in Austria. Uh, it's a place called Kanuntum, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, near the uh, Slavic border and, and Hungary. And it's very under the series of mountains, and they have been quarried over the years, uh, heavily quarried. So they are, are kind of their tops cut off, uh, amongst other things. Um, and uh, the one of the um, uh, cl uh, the people who actually own one of the quarries decide to to uh, to give back to the city of Kalantum what in a way the quarry had taken away, which was the Roman ruins. And the Roman ruins, which existed over many years, uh, and that site, which was a Roman settlement. Um, you know, over many, many years, one of the largest Roman settlements in, 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 in Europe, and there is no residue of it there except for very few, like few, few uh, objects. Uh, and they, these objects found their way to this kind of uh, villa uh, near the Danube, and they, uh, it's like a museum. But the, the terrain is very interesting because of the quarrying uh, of the land, kind of, it, it has sometimes uh, kind of severe sheer uh, terracing and uh, so on. The third project I will show is a, a study for the, um, this is the, other one is Danube, the Danube, the river, the, the Great Danube. The other one is also in Austria. There's a commission for the study of what they call an area called the Spitilau, which is on the Danube Canal. And we had to look at the, um, the uh, Otto Wagner arches and how we can actually uh, reuse them and how we can uh, add program which can then relate back to the university which is uh, above it and near it, and it's a very strange area where all the kind of tunnels for the subways have been, uh, you know, replaced by new ones. So there's a lot of uh, residual land and uh, disused land which had to be used again uh, for uh, other facilities. Uh, the one only competition we've ever done in London, which we lost, uh, the, the uh, French Lycée. So I'll go, I, I will, excuse me if I fly through these because it is, you know, like flicking through a sketchbook. Going back to the, uh, to the Copenhagen, Copenhagen um, which is on the harbor, there were a series of uh, harbor developments uh, in Copenhagen, one of which was the, uh, the library, which was further up, and the other one was the uh, concert hall. And there were a series of concert halls, which were supposed to be all jammed in into this one uh, kind of, as this, this kind of uh, one space, and we decided that in a, uh, instead of kind of them placed next to each other, maybe they could really uh, kind of be contained in a box and they kind of overlap and they rest over each other. So these are early sketches about how uh, this, this idea that these kind of uh, these uh, spaces could uh, go over each other and eventually to lead to uh, that some of these roofs obviously could be used uh, for other things and that it can engage. So it becomes, the whole piece becomes like a one large rock which is carved away 
and these kind of spaces which are carved away, some are internal, which become the theaters, and some of them are external, where they become spaces where you can move. So what we began to kind of appear is that the space which is carved away from the rock have, in a way, are also three-dimensional in the sense that they are dictated by the kind of the exterior spaces which are adjacent to them. Uh, a study of how these uh, three auditoriums rest over each other and make kind of one universe of these um, musical activities. And we can, uh, one of the ideas was also that it is like a kind of a, a synthetic uh, rock, so it becomes like a terrazzo with kind of different uh, kind of ingredients which in it, which define different kind of spaces. And the idea also that it connects back to the city and connects to the harbor and the water and the, the, the plains of these tilted uh, conditions which are uh, the auditoriums be connect to the water. The, the front was uh, a, a kind of another piece which is much lighter and it's all public facilities and the back is against the kind of the, the wall of services, uh, all the uh, spaces which are uh, the, 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 the actual uh, music rooms. And I'm sorry I have to kind of uh, run through this, but I have four carousels and, and, um, and you have to bear with me. And I say this at the beginning so that you don't all flee. The, the quarry in uh, Kanuntum, this is the uh, further away is, is the Danube. Uh, and there are four, they were given to us uh, four sites. And they are like a series of, um, I hate to use the word folly, but they're kind of basically very small buildings, one each, uh, which is a museum. Uh, to, to house these uh, uh, remains of the kind of, uh, not dead people, but um, uh, I only say that because uh, Patrick uh, Schumacher, who is a, a co-author on this project, wrote remains of humans, and I said, you know, it doesn't have dead people, and he's German, and, and he insists that his English is very good, it isn't. Um, so it, it has what, what looks like people remains, but they're actually rocks, so they are so disfigured, they're hardly uh, kind of visible. Um, and we are on the top quarry, which is still active. So what is interesting about this terrain is that uh, because of the quarrying of the land, it terraces all the way down to the Danube. Uh, the, the church, I don't know if I have a pointer, but anyway, there is a church there, and, and next to it is a place which they call the Belvedere, which is uh, like a space which is quarried, and they wanted like a plateau where they can, people can actually go and observe the landscape. And, and there are a series of sites, one which is a pavilion uh, for the history of the mountain, uh, one which is a theater, uh, going back to the idea of the kind of the quarry being the beginning of the, uh, the, the amphitheater to use the kind of the existing formation of the land of the, from the old quarry uh, to build uh, a theater and then a museum. So this is kind of a panoramic view of the hall, uh, the, 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 the quarry which is still uh, operating, which mostly will stop working in about two years' time, and they, um, there is kind of a question whether this could be also uh, made into something else and not just uh, uh, to be used uh, maybe with its machinery. Uh, what is interesting about it, because of the quarrying condition, it has this kind of tremendous terracing and also these uh, heaps and mountains of uh, pebbles and so on. Um, the quarry is a, a real AA project uh, in the sense that, it, you know, you can uh, fall in love with the with the, the sand and so on. So through this kind of um, idea of kind of studying these conditions uh, on the, of the rock, one began to develop a series of ideas as to how to place uh, these things and how they could be connected together because it would be, we did not really want to just to place these things on the perimeter uh, of these um, things. And so each of these, uh, each of these landscapes had a very particular uh, condition and we wanted that although they are, have to be connected, that the, each condition represents itself in a different kind of project. On the, on the, this, on the left is the, is the plateau, the Belvedere, which is a space which could be seen like, uh, as if like, uh, as like a, uh, um, a giant diving board which uh, one can stand on. We never really knew what it was for. Uh, and uh, which, which is roofed. So you can basically experience the mountain through this. Uh, the other one, which is on the top, is a, a, a place where there's uh, the, this pavilion for um, the history of the mountain and, and all the quarrying and the ruins and the Roman settlements. And that was basically like a, based on the idea of kind of um, 
uh, geological faults, so that there are two pieces of uh, like a building which uh, c uh, connect and they are like a, like a scissor cutting through the mountain. And the third one is to go against the idea of the quarry being an amphitheater, but to build a new piece which attaches itself, so it encloses the theater. Um, and then at the bottom is a, a very simple space, which is a museum, a library, and, and uh, um, space for some of these drawings. The, the mountain at the point is kind of, it's, a, it's like a peak, which is, it's very rugged, and therefore the, on the edge is placed this piece which we want to feel as if it is a synthetic piece <coughs> of the mountain, but it, be, it, it doesn't seem as a kind of, a kind of monumental object uh, landing on it. So as if one of these plates just lifts up and become of a different material, maybe concrete or metal, and, and slides into the edge of the rock. So the, the, this connects also to paths which begin to connect the four sides. And one goes up to form the, a roof. And then the other two or three kind of begin to cut into the mountain and beca become al almost a cut into the lower side of the mountain so that you can actually, as you walk through it, you begin to go down on the edge of the mountain and use it. The idea of these falls, which could imply that the landscape around uh, these two buildings, which are uh, the pavilion, uh, could begin to kind of uh, change the theater and the pavilion. And the pavilion is basically two uh, spaces which interlock, and in a section they become like a kind of uh, an X, and, and they have these, uh, you know, like, um, basically it could be open to the elements, so you walk through it and see uh, maybe uh, the rock which has, uh, was on site before. One is, one is stone and one is glass. And the third one is um, the theater, which you leave the, the, the kind of quarrying of the amount of the kind of the, the contours as they are, and you build a new uh, cantilevered uh, plates for the uh, theater. And the fourth one is at the and because the eye are very separate, at a particular point in time, when you cut a section through the mount, the, the whole side, you actually can see all these products in one, in one line. So the museum, um, the quarry, uh, the museum, the kind of the, the Belvedere, the pavilion, and the uh, theater all coincide. And we thought this might be an interesting way of looking at the museum, so that like it becomes like a black hole where all these things. Uh, all these ideas which had to do with the mountain, had to do with the kind of the quarrying and so on, is sucked into the museum. So the museum is made of like, uh, like these plates which uh, sl uh, very uh, gently uh, shift above the ground to make these different spaces. There's an existing rock uh, which on the side and this becomes part of the interior of this museum. So it's like two, uh, two spaces, one which is uh, partly museum, partly uh, other facilities, which they use like workshops, and the one above is the library and other exhibition spaces. So they kind of all flow into each other, and it doesn't represent exactly the section of the mountain, but it relates to it in terms of kind of uh, material and also uh, in terms of simplicity and how the section is condensed to one point. Just to go back to the, to, to the Belvedere, which is at the edge of this uh, sharp cut. And what is, what is also very similar on the side, they are all connected together, but there's a kind of, at one point, there's not a gentle drop, but a very severe, a severe drop. So at one point, there is a kind of a, a folded place in the mountain where these things rest. And they are very close to each other. And there's a view of the whole uh, mountain showing all these different places, the, the quarry, uh, which is much higher up with all the kind of uh, space above uh, the, the Belvedere, the museum, the theater, and the pavilion, uh, and the existing uh, church kind of all coincide into one space. And what we look, all we wanted to look at is how this could be kind of connected through landscape and paths, which could become a journey between these, uh, all these elements. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I have to go. I'm, I know I'm flying through this, but um, I always think I can take this liberty in England because in Germany I'm banned from going too fast. Of course I do, but uh, I'm always punished afterwards. Um, I'm supposed to show everything and ponder on every line, and um, I'll get to that in the next, in the last two projects. Um, this is the the site for the for the Danube um, Canal, and we were commi we were asked to do a study a of the. If you see on the on the left, there is the existing shore of the canal, uh, which is uh, you know which is which has to be a landscape. There is the arches, which are not really very large; it's like four meters wide, which have to be remodeled uh, and reused. Next to when there is a tunnel, where there used to be a kind of subway line which used to go into, I mean, it's exposed tunnel, it's lower ground, which used to go into a tunnel which is like in here, uh, which is m maybe 60 meters uh, deep or whatever. And, and then, then there are always other lines of railways. What they've done is they've made this line, this tunnel disused, and therefore they want to use it for other things. And they have invented other kind of bridges and so on. The, these are the Otto Wagner bridges, which cannot be really demolished or anything. And the way you, you, have, you can only build around them in a sort of between brackets, lightweight structure, so you can't really, you can only hug them and not touch them. So this is, uh, and obviously it all slopes down into a zero uh, point. So at one point, at zero, things either peel up or peel down into the tunnel. And the idea that there would be a series of projects which are on the canal, uh, which, which, another one which is, uh, and the others uh, further down, uh, the canal which is a water purification plant, which we, we, one can look into later on, but for the moment we looked at the idea that, A, how to invent facilities in this area, which is very close to two major universities in Vienna, uh, technical university and uh, uh, economic university and biology, they're very big campuses, and they have no life beyond the, the kind of the, uh, the motorway and the road, so how to invent facilities which they could use and also how to kind of really begin to regenerate this, this used uh, piece of land. So the, the, uh, we looked at the, the, the geometry of all these uh, infinite uh, highways and bridges and new bridges uh, create kind of one uh, urban geometry and, and another one which was existing fabric of the city. And how one then begins to kind of really look at all these two conditions so we look at kind of one, which is piece, which can kind of cut into the arches, uh, sit over them, you know, whatever. And we began to really kind of uh, uh, evolve through this is that because we cannot uh, really cut through it, we can make some cuts through it, but the building cannot cut through it. It had to kind of, uh, it had to be like a, a, a wrapping uh, uh, drop. So it became first uh, a ribbon, and then the ribbon because it had to, uh, to break uh, as it kind of, uh, as it moves through the, this uh, arch, it began to break, and therefore it, it is not fragmented, but it is, it seemed like one solid piece which goes in and out uh, of the arches and begin to engage the different levels of this, uh, this existing condition. So these could be much more flexible spaces for people who want to live there, uh, uh, kind of have studio for artists, or they could become eating facilities for diversity. And we also wanted to look at a way of connecting it directly to the, to the, to the university by m making kind of habitable bridges <coughs> and uh, creating a landscape and decking on the water and therefore to kind of generate a life uh, in this area which is, uh, which is now only basically a series of garages. And how these things begin to kind of re over, uh, lap over each other in and, and elevation. Their, their composition and, and different kind of uh, views and early model mind was much, uh, much thinner, more like a ribbon, and how it begins to kind of even have separate entrances on the, uh, on the embankment of the canal, and you go into these spaces. So you can have more than one option. You can have an option of going either into an arch and use them naturally or singly, or you go into the, these ribbons and, and you can use them continuously. So you, you begin to have more than like one journey through this uh, otherwise, uh, you know, these dead uh, spaces. <coughs> One which is uh, a path which, is, which it can carry on for 
uh, for pedestrians, uh, for cyclists, which connect to the bridges, which are more re done more than recently. And obviously the subway still kind of is in the layer behind. And we had to also look at the existing tunnel and what could be used. Could be used for theaters, for facilities for the university. They also wanted a space where uh, it's like a kind of a, a, a virtual world for children's education. So one becomes a kind of a very synthetic kind of space, which is like a museum, but also where people can try out uh, things. All the different spaces, and they obviously are very separate from each other and very adjacent to each other uh, with different facilities. And so in each, this, this kind of catalog shows what each place is in harmony, uh, because we had to present this to the senators and um, senator and Vienna, what are the kind of these places like. Showing the layers of, of the thing, which, because it, it comes from the front and goes into the, the back, which is the space. It was very difficult to understand uh, the different layers of the site because they vary from above ground to below ground, and it's very, they are very inaccessible. Uh, there are hardly any stairs going through them and so on. So we had to really kind of uh, uh, find a way that these things are kind of continuous uh, and connects all these uh, spaces together. So you can, if you walk on the embankment, you can enter one of these uh, rivers and you go uh, up in a kind of uh, other stairs or ramps into the space which could be used uh, for eating or, or living or working. And you can either go down to space below, which is this multimedia spaces, or you go out on the terrace or leave. So you begin to use uh, continuously uh, the entire space in and out. Uh, so, we were really puzzled why we were asked to do this um, a gatehouse to the French Lycée. First, the idea of gate, uh, I've never flirted with uh, in my life. Even when it was very fashionable, everybody did a gate to something. Uh, gate to every city, gate to every life. And so, we thought, and, and the gate was, a, they call it the gatehouse, but it was a basically a place for, for garbage, kind of a, a glorious uh, room for garbage uh, collection. And the other one was a kind of a place for security, uh, so that you know basically uh, all the children were being harassed by perverts, according to the to the families, and they wanted kind of some sort of control at the gate. Um, it is very overcrowded. The French say it's kind of bursting with children and uh, uh, teenagers, and and, um, and so they uh, and also they wanted some more classrooms which they can use for flexible facilities for entertainment and so on. So we first uh, thought of this as a kind of a, like a landscape, and obviously we could not have a landscape and space on the ground. So we decided to look at, again, the idea of the classroom uh, as a kind of a space. It became like a kind of children's uh, kind of game, and how these kind of all these things can come together like a, like a jigsaw. So this kind of the idea of the landscape begins to kind of come together like as if you are um, like pieces of land accidentally kind of coming together in a space which was given to them. And the idea was that you know, it ha obviously it, ha it should not have any presence on the ground, uh, hardly any presence on the ground, because the idea of the ground becomes a filter where you filter through the building. And above ground is made of these kind of, spe uh, kind of boxes which become the classrooms and they are like landscapes. So they separated, these classrooms are separated either from the apartment for the caretaker by, by air, like a terrace. Uh, they are separated from each other by another air gap. And so they all can kind of fall into this one space. Uh, which becomes the space which is above uh, the actual entrance uh, to this thing. If I go back to this, we could not really do anything with the forecourt, which has a kind of uh, a roundabout, uh, because that's where all the vans stop and so on. And what we thought was very nice is because these, these spares are somehow accidentally rest on the same plane, these two classrooms can actually want to operate together. Uh, some of these walls could all open up to make one very large space from the indoor to the outdoor. But what was interesting is because the ground is, uh, is clear uh, with the structure only landing on various points and also the, the place of, of uh, kind of security is suspended between these two zones of the ground, the lower ground of the playground and above ground. Uh, so that this kind of box which is uh, held which becomes a security box. And 
you can see how they can have, uh, other, they can have very uh, precariously simplex to each other with these kind of air gaps uh, between them so that these could, rooms could be used uh, for different things or together. The apartment uh, on one and and they all have a degree of transparency, uh, obviously. So it becomes, it becomes almost kind of a transparent kind of field uh, above the entrance of the lycée. In the last, um, you know, um, primarily, predominantly this last uh, six years and the last nine years, we have been preoccupied with certain things which uh, had to do with kind of uh, 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 buildings and, and, and kind of urbanity. And I can only hint on this because um, I can only show it through the work in a sense. We were all preoccupied from the beginning and when we did the peak with the idea of kind of a, a landscape and a synthetic landscape and the invention of kind of a space which is, uh, which is the void. And the void in the peak was really the space which was left out from the top two beams, the lower two beams, which become central to this building. And this idea of the void kind of carried on. So there's one which is the idea of the void, the other one which is the idea of kind of lightness. And, and which, but pre, what predominated all this was the, 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 the making of a new kind of order which can either occupy the interiors of the buildings or occupy the ground. And, and through these, all these uh, kind of causal preoccupations, how you then Manipulate, manipulate the ground, how you, these buildings kind of rest on, on it, and what is a new kind of geometry which can occupy the ground, what can generate a new life and so on. This is the Canon uh, Harbor. We have been in the last also four or five years invited to do many uh, endless kind of harbor studies in Germany, uh, two, three in Hamburg, uh, one in Dusseldorf and, and Cologne. And because of the condition of the harbor, obviously there is an existing, an existing kind of culture of the harbor, which is existing warehouses. And obviously once these are gone, for the first time the two sides of the city begin, on the Rhine, begin to kind of uh, connect. And uh, there's only a fragment of all the work which has been done. One which, one which was that through looking at the kind of the city uh, map, we began to realize that this doesn't have to be only re uh, developed as a kind of a linear strip uh, on the on the Rhine, but, began, but what, we, what we began to look at is these kind of uh, very big gaps, which are carved away in the existing uh, fabric of the city. And we began, began to look at how these two fields, the existing field and the new field, begin to come together, either in a comfortable or in a very uncomfortable way. And so we had to look at what is the connection between the city and, and the industry, what is it, and how the whole idea of architecture and landscape begin to kind of come together into the making of these projects. Because these are also uh, sites for uh, flooding, that therefore it implied that the ground has a different kind of condition where it could be wet, the buildings could be lifted up and so on. So we began to kind of think of this as a series of, uh, of fields uh, which uh, kind of uh, rest uh, on the side, and these fields kind of overlap as, and they make a dif different uh, things. One which is a field which becomes like a podium which engages the kind of the uh, basin. And they, they all have program which connect back to the city. So they begin, they begin to become like a way which connects these, these two parts of the city together. This is the space which is around the, 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 the basin which becomes uh, facilities which is to do with uh, boating and so on. So these become really giant fields uh, which kind of become like a landscape, uh, although synthetic, uh, resting on the ground. The second one is, uh, and it breaks the site into three, uh, three segments. 
and which goes kind of partly under the tunnel and over the tunnel and connects back to the city. So it's not the idea that the city, the condition of the context of the city begins to kind of flood uh, the, this kind of neutral uh, new zone, but that the pieces which are invented for the site which begin to kind of invade the city. Land scan and sport facilities which connect it to the housing. So another curiosity is that the program which was almost given in the brief was mostly uh, of a program of very small buildings which are, you know, like chocolate museums and uh, things like this, which we call the cookies. And these cookies are just kind of really uh, just sprinkled uh, onto the side and they relate more to the existing context behind it. So there's a kind of a field of these cookies which are uh, film museums, chocolate museums, but the guy who was donating the money was a chocolate factory owner. And therefore, the, when one begins to actually look at the different scales, which is the scale of these new in inventions, interventions which are the towers which become a space for living and working and how they relate back to the, to the bridges. So there are different scales which one begins to notice. And although one, one doesn't have to be contextual as such, but you begin to kind of actually layer the site in a horizontal kind of way, and each of these things, these fields, do different things, whether they are underground, above, or so. A mural which was done um, in, in a show for a show in, um, in Holland. Another study was for a, a project in Madrid, which is to look at really how, we decided to look at how Madrid could, the idea was how to, it could expand beyond its existing uh, boundaries. We began to look at as how it already had grown uh, over this period of time. And what are these different kind of uh, textures of the city from the kind of very old uh, to, the, to the new? And they obviously between them find, uh, kind of invent their own uh, fields which have their own uh, kind of uh, a dynamic. And we said that it's like the city has been kind of squeezed into like an elongated ball and squeezed more to make this, to kind of condense the, the level of intervention to very specific areas in Madrid. The, like many other cities, very big kind of leftover sites from disused railways is in the south, and they somehow connect, begin to kind of, these enormous fields begin to connect to the, to the motorway and also these satellite towns, which are areas of, of incredible poverty. And we thought that we, well, because of this ability of land, one can really invent a program which can then, you know, uh, be available to all these uh, very small satellite towns, uh, which operate almost like a necklace around Madrid, and they can begin to be engaged in the landscape. Uh, facilities which are open, like a kind of, not a beach, but it's like it's a sport facilities, education facilities, and uh, it's basically kind of non- uh, kind of uh, space for available for all these people. So these kind of satellites are on the edge and they kind of begin to use these formations which are left over from the railway and made into kind of these kind of uh, colossal landscapes which become uh, these facilities. Uh, there is one kind of, there's a series of corridors, one of which has already a gateway, uh, which we thought that because it already, the city has already expanded beyond the gateway, that the gateway is then multiplied through another field of gateways. And then this kind of idea, this, this, this kind of city, which is a squeeze, uh, is then, for, the, for our purpose of our project, we decided to condense all these facilities in terms of kind of leisure and sport, uh, living and working into this existing corridor, which goes from east to west uh, between the airport and the city. So that one defines these corridors, which can be actually available for development instead of kind of really uh, at, at infinitum, sprinkling the city with programs which are not really thought about. And so one, from one empty field to another, uh, this is the uh, vial, um, the site for the Beecher fire station. Beecher is really on the edge of this uh, the enormous field of, uh, of the railway tracks. You see the, the building just uh, partly in the edge of the Caesar building. We did a workshop for Weil uh, three years ago as to how you connect the, the existing city to, the, to uh, the industry and how you resolve the problem with the industry, the city, and the idea of the landscape. And what is the possibility for Weil 
to actually invent itself as a kind of uh, not a metropolis but a kind of an urban condition. Advise on the these are the, the three borders which uh, coincide Germany, Switzerland, and um, uh, and France. They're very close to each other. Um, uh, what what exists in terms of program? The only thing I, I'm not, not seeing it. Driving to Weil, uh, you only see kind of a little windows which says "Peeping Tom," and and therefore you understand the Swiss uh, come there for um, some degree of indulgence. Otherwise, not not allowed in Switzerland. And so we, we, we looked at the kind of um, these uh, these kind of leftover spaces, which are uh, also dictated by the railway. How you can really make a kind of uh, these satellite towns on the a on the edge of the city, and how you begin to the idea how the factory can expand beyond its boundaries. What is the idea of the factory connecting to the city? What is the geometry of the city, which kind of then converge onto the factory side, and how they can deal with the idea of landscape and how it begins to come into the the Vitra fire station and how that comes into the Vitra factory. Um, this was before our building went up. There, is, there, were, there was an old entrance on the top and there was uh, obviously the new entrance which, which was opened four years ago with the Gary um, Chair Museum. And some of the beginning was the idea that how you bring in and simultaneously how you kind of suck in urbanism into the side and how you kind of suck in the landscape simultaneously. And we decided also that, that a way for the future to, to develop this site is that because of the massive uh, roof uh, scape on these, uh, these enormous uh, sheds, that they could be used for other facilities which can then connect back to the idea of decking and the idea of the, the railway and so on. So this kind of, this, this kind of, uh, uh, the speed in which this, this idea of these two gates, the entrances, begin to actually uh, operate. And what is the space in between? So these are the fields coming into the site. And when we decided to, to, to do, and I'll show that later on, how to place the walls of the building that they are uh, almost uh, dictate the line of the new extension of the, of the factories into the site, and how it becomes a constant, a permanent void in the space. Very earlier on, uh, it was a very difficult product to actually do uh, because uh, of this colossal mass of the sheds and the side of the, of the, of the, kind of the actual space. And so we, we made many proposals. Uh, one, by accident, was photographed against uh, this London painting and discovered earlier on that this, this whole product needed another kind of investigation beyond just the idea of the fire station. And so what we looked at is that uh, if you take the, uh, the existing sheds as if they are uh, one colossal mass, so they form almost like a, kind of like a, like a mountain, and you have a, 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 a space next to them, like kind of a, a cliff, and then if then you look inside this kind of uh, colossal mass, you have these enormous uh, uh, rooms which become the production areas, and if then the next mass comes along, the, the new one, what, is, what, what you have is a side which is a full of these giant uh, sheds. So we decided to actually that we impose a space which is like the rooms on the inside, but it is outdoors, but becomes a kind of an outdoor room, and that's where uh, what becomes like a corridor in the factory, which becomes more public, it connects the, the two spaces together, and that's where the fire station will be placed. It had no place yet, there was no site uh, yet uh, for this. And then we began to look at other gaps in the, in the, in the, in the factory and where other facilities could begin to uh, be uh, injected. So this is the kind of the outdoor room, the, the void, the car space, which begins to be, you know, one can actually place facilities which are just not to do with the kind of everyday operation of the factory. So dictated by this line, this corridor was kind of then, what began to occur is that the spaces which are very, some are very rigid, some are quite flexible, are uh, a series of walls which kind of, uh, like the landscape, enter the side of the factory and begin to uh, make up uh, a skyline, in a sense, uh, which is internal to the space. The idea of the landscape, the spaces between the existing sheds, 
the idea of the horizontal versus the vertical surfaces. And the idea that this void, which is in the middle of it, well, between the two, this was a virtual side for the factories. It wasn't even yet built. Uh, and that, w that when, when it is there, you ma have this colossal mass. And how do you break this mass by injecting a thing, a thing there? And so this was a kind of also a journey through the site, that there are a series of buildings which are placed on route, um, and through the also uh, looking at the, the choreography of the of the of the uh, fire uh, fighters, um, that this kind of the idea of the walls began to emerge, and that the, some of the bridges began to emerge, and how they can use this to kind of save uh, these things. Another thing which began to occur is the idea of this kind of wall, which began to shrink and expand according to program uh, and how then this led to the really this making of a series of planes and eventually made it into a series of volumes. So the, the, the program was reduced from kind of many spaces to uh, and it began the program began to expand and shrink continuously because on one hand it was only a garage and then it began to have a gymnasium uh, a club room uh, and so on. And on the other hand, because of course it had to kind of be constantly shaved, uh, so these two kind of things began to operate together. So it began, as I said earlier, in a series of walls. Between them, there are four uh, volumes: one which is the the actual shed, the garage, and three which are these other facilities. And we began to also uh, change is the change from the idea of the walls to the idea of the volumes and what it meant in terms of these, kind of these spaces which constantly slide into each other. And because knowing how things are, that we thought that maybe the, the life of the fire station could actually take on, that this building could actually have other facilities uh, uh, at, at some other time. So the shed could be used for uh, some seminars and the actual rooms could be used for events. The basic elements of this uh, building are made of the, the, all the beams, all the walls, um, all the pieces. And what happened at some point in time, two events took place at the same time. One, which is the two volumes which were separated, began to kind of uh, converge. And one piece, which was the roof, uh, by the kind of pl the cutting of it to uh, this kind of wall, which becomes also a structural wall, a beam holding the roof and holding the room upstairs. Um, it splits it into two parts. So there's two simultaneous, two simultaneous actions take place. One which is uh, the, the volumes begin to converge and the roof begins to break. So we want to kind of, these very two differences between two spaces. One, which is the garage, which is, uh, had a, kind of a, a degree of lightness because it only rested on four, uh, on four uh, kind of uh, structural bases. And when it's open, then it is very light. And the other one, which is that these three volumes, which are made of concrete, uh, kind of come into it. And because obviously the way they would use the building, these things have to be, have a kind of, there's a scenario about how they come from the side building, they enter the main space, they go into the wet rooms, and there are these three beams. The wet beam, which is the changing rooms, showers, the second beam is like a space where they exercise or they train, and the top uh, floor is a, where they meet casually, and it's a space more intimate, uh, they don't live in this building. Unlike other fire stations, they don't live there. Uh, they're not there 24 hours a day. They are mostly workers who are volunteer firemen and women. And um, so, but they want to have a space which is like home. And all the, this was just part of the landscape, which was approximate to us and the idea was that the whole side should be kind of really dealt with as a series of landscape program. So this is earlier, before this thing took place, uh, the, the two volumes in the front were separate, and the roof was one, and then one act, these two things uh, changed. These photographs by Hélène Binet for the kind of the, the uh, steel work for the roof, it conforms another kind of landscape. The, the beam which comes from the ground going up to hold the space above, so this is where you see these two spaces kind of overlap, but the wall which, where the metal work was going on, the shuttering for the, for the roof. And so the roof rests on these four uh, 
walls, and when the doors are open in the back and the front, it, 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 it kind of, and the side is glass, it has almost, uh, it's, it's three meters, 30 meters, and it's very light. I mean, this, what we really try to do is to make a series of spaces which could be used for the garage, but could also be used uh, as a kind of, for other activities. A study of the elevation and the composition of these pieces, how they begin to kind of connect to each other. The point where the roof breaks to make an entrance canopy, uh, and the side also, the idea that you bring in light onto that plane continuously, whether day or night, and the side is this is a kind of cut where, the, where there is a uh, kind of a lighting to light the wall. A study of all the fencing surrounding the factory was another brief, which is to think of all the walls around the factory, the fencing, and how instead of making kind of solid walls, you may begin make, to make a kind of a, a series of kind of these uh, poles which become transparent. So it's not just really uh, walls. And this idea of the plane made of poles become the structure for the canopy. And the light coming through the side as it, this thing breaks away. Uh, we, uh, earlier, uh, shot before the building was, um, uh, before the glazing went up, where it was very raw and, and unfinished. The point of entrance where the canopy hits the roof and the, the, the gap where, you, where all these spaces actually meet. So you enter the, either the garage or the main spaces at this point in time under this gap uh, above you. So this is the glass you're looking at from the garage into uh, across to the entrance. The glass beam, the beam at the end is glazed, coming into the kind of the garage. That had to be there had to be kind of a break between these two spaces in terms of kind of perfumes and, and regulations, so that they have to go on the side to the to the building. And the intention was that any given moment in time, every time you cut through this building, you can see through to the other spaces. So it goes back to the, uh, one of our other preoccupations was the whole idea of layering or horizontal or, or vertical and how it is, what is the idea of layering, whether it is solid or transparent and what it does to these uh, spaces. A uh, study of the wall and the room upstairs. Study of the louvers, which because it's a south-facing spaces. The Richard chair by um, Philip Stark. And then we began to look at the kind of the, the composition of the volumes and how they kind of relate to each other, and ultimately what is the quality of light uh, of all these uh, volumes. And so the building also transforms at night, that it moves from kind of uh, volumes to the light, uh, the lighting through a set of planes. And you, you now you see almost every space in the building. You see the, the wedge beam, which is in the front. You see through the gymnasium, the kind of space of exercise, to the kind of uh, far end across the courtyard, where the um, <coughs> equipment room is, and the room upstairs. And also you see the light from the canopy on the edge. And you go around the corner and to the courtyard where the room upstairs can't leave it over the courtyard or this kind of this outdoor space. Pascal and Don Bates, acting as surgeons. It wasn't me who took this picture, someone else. You know, I liked them so much and, and gave it to me. And if you are on the inside of the equipment room, this is where they put their uh, so-called very kind of uh, sophisticated uh, uh, kind of firefighting equipment, and they can run, they can wear it, and they can go into the trucks. And if you go around the building, the back, these doors are uh, open, and the idea that 
They want to use this building for other facilities. They can open the doors, uh, drive the fire trucks to the back, close the doors, and uh, they can use it for other functions. And I'll go through another journey through this building uh, and through it. All the lighting in the garage and the floor. The doors are operate mechanically, so they uh, slide through to the entrance. And when you are inside the space, the, the walls in the back lines up with the new uh, factory, so to kind of make this uh, space between the old and the new factories. And if, if you are in, in one place to the, to the long space, the, the meeting, the building in total is 90 meters long, and you can't see across the whole space. And because of its length, it actually has a, you are deceived by the, uh, the space begin to shrink and expand as you are in them. And because the factory is, is closed at night, you know, the lighting inside multiplies on the outside and becomes the lighting for the street. So if you are inside the, 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 this exercise uh, room and you see all the way out into the outside the space. The, all the colors are muted. There is no, there, there are only uh, short walls which are painted in bright colors. Uh, dark green and dark red and one wall which is a wall of light which is gold. The gap between these two uh, there's two front spaces. This is a door which some people think, think goes to nowhere, uh, but it goes to a, a kind of secret space which Vitra needed for their um, computer storage. Some intelligent architect thought I was so stupid I made a door which goes nowhere. Uh, and I really I thought that was really terrific. There are three doors in this building. And one of them I just put there because I felt like it. <laughs> just to tease this French architect, a friend of Anne Balfour's. <laughs> Maybe she thought this was went to nowhere. She's right. Um, this is the, the the gap between these two. These are all sliding doors. That at any given time, some of these spaces become really. Uh, with, with, when the glazing, when the doors are open, that becomes it becomes really a building with no, with hardly any kind of, uh, with all completely open. The lighting is really the, the extension of the space upstairs. So the lighting was always kind of on the edge of these uh, walls, and to, to kind of that it goes back to this idea of that this is a building made of a series of walls, which eventually became volumes. Uh, the, the, stain, the, the steel cabinets which become, a, 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 instead of putting doors between the two beams, they become a kind of a partition between the front beam and the, and the back beam, and they become also locker rooms for the firemen. And where the two volumes overlap on the ground, they cut, there's a cut in the ceiling, and that becomes where the stair is, which becomes an open dread stair, uh, and can't leave it from the wall. The cut in the ceiling. As you go upstairs, looking down across to the blue wall, the two beams which are upstairs, which one goes down to hold the roof. And then the terrace, which is at a slight incline, is this, the, obviously the roof of the space downstairs. The louvers, the recess of the, and the concrete wall for the, to the, the glass to slide down. The lightning was not organized by me, um, the photographer took care of that. And obviously when the building is used by, by people, it is, uh, it is um, very different. According to Vitra, there are 60,000 people which went to see it in the last year, a number which still staggers me. 
And I find it's not, not, no longer just the uh, architects and architectural students, it's, I don't know, who goes there. And we prayed for a year that it won't rain on the day of the opening, but it did. But also it was very strange because of the kind of the tarmac on the floor. The, the landscape is made of this kind of series of uh, strips, which is pebble, tarmac, grass, and mud. And obviously because of the kind of, because of, it becomes blacker uh, as the tarmac. And the furniture, which is also operates kind of as a way of sitting and eating and, and um, like barbecue place where they can use, they can use this kind of courtyard individually. And the idea that the firemen, which are, who are part of the workforce at Vitra, could really begin to uh, invite other workers to use this building uh, as a kind of, like a, like a kind of a facility for the workers and they can use it um, to entertain each other or to invite other people. It becomes like a really like a social condenser for the Vitra fires, for the Vitra factory. And because of the kind of, it's, it, is, it is a utilitarian building, the transparency is enormous between the inside and the outside. You almost can, sometimes cannot tell. This was a suit bought for me, which I refused to wear. Um, I thought they were kidding with me, and I didn't want to wear it. But uh, a student of mine did. Uh, I, if you've been here, would know Simon Cum Jan the Third, who once threatened to jump off the balcony upstairs, but he did not, and he is wearing a suit. And I come to the last product, which is the Dusseldorf Harbor Development. This is a kind of a, you know, uh, one of the most uh, really um, enjoyable and thrilling products, but also um, the most painful and, and uh, nightmarish. Um, we, we entered this competition five years ago, or four and a half years ago, which we won, which was in Bayer competition, which we won, and we did a feasibility with then. We, did, uh, we waited for a year to be commissioned to do the working, to the building permit, and which we did. Uh, and um, then we have to wait another year and a half uh, for it, for them to get their leasing together and their financing. And we haven't really had a sign of what is going on exactly. But all we know is that they decide that after four and a half years, they may, they ha need another alternative and they might invite another architect to do another scheme there, who happens to be a friend of mine. And they said to me, no, he's a friend of yours. I said, well, after this, he's not. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so this person, who I won't name, has been calling everybody in the globe saying, that has upset with me, it's not my fault. They tricked me. And I thought, well, he's 65 years old. <coughs> he's not that dumb. They can't trick him. Um, so we'll see what happens. He's spending a lot of money on phone calls, I must say. In the meantime, I'm being very polite and, and kind of innocent. I'll play the game for a change. Um, like all the cities in, in Europe, they have, you know, uh, and not like London, really, because London, D Dockland is a bit further away from the city. It is really a satellite. These are very, very close to the city. This is the center here and the tower is at the edge of the site. And so in, in, in Germany, they go through these uh, things, which as they say, you know, one year they build, every city has to have a museum, the next year they have to have a, you know, a stadium, then the Congress Hall, a concert hall, and so on. And then four or five years ago, they decided that they will have uh, media centers. So Cologne, uh, Dusseldorf, and they are obviously, uh, the harbor developments are appropriate sites for for areas which can still have artists, uh, media facilities, recording studios, photography, and so on, and cinemas, and so on. So these become really uh, uh, places for this, this new program. The existing site, uh, the site had an existing building on it, which is very popular uh, amongst artists. And so through careful observation of the site, this is a site which is 200 meters long, 
by like 60, 70 meters wide. And um, so but, but it was very important for us, like in all these uh, projects, that how do you then uh, invent first a program which is appropriate for this, uh, this air area which has no kind of, which has no context anymore. Its context is, it is in the city, but it's, it has no, uh, its immediate context is very, in terms of scale, it's very large, but it's obviously it's used because the warehouses are no longer operational as warehouses. Um, uh, and what is the idea of its scale? What is the idea of its kind of, uh, what kind of um, landscape should it have? And what kind of skyline should it have for the rest of the harbor? This was one of the first products for the harbor, therefore it had kind of, one had to have an idea about what this whole area should be. And so it began to look from the beginning that because of the requirement of the site, that we did not want to have a podium which then again blocks the street from the water. And that was a very important thing in our agenda that whatever you invent on the ground, or whichever you invent as a program which is, could operate as a civic program, as a public program, which is not fortified for only kind of uh, you know, the offices, that they should really engage in the ground in a very different way. And so we began to, to look at how this, this ground condition can allow uh, for this. And basically what we, we, we had eventually uh, dealt with was that there are a series of kind of plays which uh, merge on the ground and through this kind of uh, cut in the building, one which becomes a kind of a carved out space, which becomes a plaza, which is cantilevered over the water. The other ones are really uh, that the ground is level on the street, and you gently approach the water by either going uh, down or going up. This is the kind of the existing, the old building which has been demolished. And so the existing kind of configuration of the harbor is that there is nothing, uh, there is no access to the water except from the, uh, this kind of very tiny kind of uh, path where people kind of go for promenades uh, on the weekend. But the, the city is blocked uh, from the water. And so we decided to replace, is that you replace the, the brick uh, box by a building which, which is kind of m makes this, this kind of transparency between the city and the water much more accessible. So it is seen as a wall that has two breaks. One major break which allows the kind of people to filter through it, and another break which is kind of, uh, in many uh, ways, is uh, the, what we call the finger building, which becomes uh, uh, another kind of, of uh, kind of offices. So when we had to look at what kind of projected life should this should building should be, and how these people could all kind of be uh, uh, occupied in it. And the idea is that, you know, if you would take, uh, uh, take kind of German regulations and require demand that there was maximum uh, light uh, for all the offices, so we designed this building around, and every office space has a kind of, um, a lot, natural light coming from all sides, but also that uh, these uh, kind of series of what you call uh, the slabette, these slabs kind of converge together uh, and separate to kind of also that every time you move around this building it changes. But what is interesting for us is that was that this space, this building is made of these endless layers, uh, and they are all transparent, and you can see through it, uh, and you are separated by your, from your neighbor uh, no, uh, by air, so you can see them, but you cannot actually touch them. This could, you know, they, they, each floor could be used laterally or they could be used in, in like a slab uh, vertically. And therefore, because of the configuration of the fingers, it implied that there was a degree of fluidity within the kind of organi internal organization. So there's basically one wall which breaks uh, at few points to form these kind of uh, clusters of building or one long building. The, the fingers are connected below on the ground by a glass box, which becomes uh, the lobby. And then because of these spaces actually converge together, uh, there are areas which are darker than the, the side where the curtain wall is, and these begin to begin to kind of be carved away and made into uh, rooms which are for presentations or meetings. So they, they, you, you move from dark to light spaces. So therefore, the quality of the light within the building uh, is constantly changing. And then we began to look at the composition of all the elements and what is the kind of the space in between the slabs, <coughs> what that could be like, and what kind of material is it the same material, is a different material and so on. You'd be happy to know I'm on my last carousel.
And then we began to look at the idea of transparency, translucency, opaqueness, solidness, and how this, what, how we can invent a skyline which is on this new development. So these are endless studies of these overlapping spaces, whether they one can use color on the interiors. That the, the quality of the building changes from day to night, that a day is, is kind of seen as these uh, volumes at night, as seen as these horizontal surfaces of the floors. And that, that because of the manipulation of the ground and the intention that uh, this is, although, although it's a civil uh, office development, that it is very important that the ground uh, remains public and becomes part of the city uh, scale, that it becomes a part of the kind of the city of Düsseldorf and it becomes an extension of these kind of urban spaces which one could either have or could have in the future. So this building kind of cuts into the ground. The idea that there's a podium which is invisible on the street, which uh, because of the marriage on the ground has studios on one side and has laquitted areas which operate all the time, restaurants on the other side. Separated by the plaza, the studios all have um, you know, water uh, access on the street, uh, on the water side. Study models showing that this long building, which begins to break, could also cut into the ground and, and has these, like on one side is a service wall, which becomes a cinema or conference center, the plaza. And then we began to look at what is this interior world would be like where um, these uh, retail areas are like shops and restaurants. So it becomes like an internal world. The idea that this, this internal world becomes a kind of a landscape and therefore becomes a terracing, which goes, the plaza dives down. So the plaza dives down and the podium lifts up. So there's a kind of a big gap between them. Early ideas about this kind of landscape uh, inside and outside. We had this picnic pits the terracing of the interior of, the, of this kind of slanted podium. And if you are in what we call block A, which is the long building, the, the, the skyline becomes your immediate view. And these, uh, this long building has every floor which kind of slightly shifts over each other to allow for kind of endless terraces over decks over there in the air looking over the harbor. There was a possibility that two or three of these floors become like um, a hotel, residential hotel, and some are offices. So one floor could become more like a like restaurant facilities. And they're off, obviously by shifting and cutting through the ground, you multiply the area of civic space uh, at, kind of at very le various levels. To go back to the, the fingers, uh, uh, the more we looked at them, the more it became evident that one or two parts of them are different. And it became very evident that one of these pieces, uh, they all, they land in different ways, that there are different heights of the ground. Some land on the ground, some go to the space below, and they are mostly lifted above ground, so you form a space on the ground which is undulating, uh, and there were two things we wanted to do. When that one building is kind of squeezed between all these glass blocks, so it becomes like a bridge, like a Virendil uh, space. And um, so therefore it has no presence of structure within it, but it's on its sides. Uh, all the Arabs who are, have been our engineers for um, the last 10 years, uh, Peter Rice, who had endlessly gave me tremendous support and help. And I have to say that without them, it would have been very difficult. And um, they have been patient and also very kind of Creative. They don't like these drawings I will show you, uh, because I one day said, you know, this is, you know, this structure is terribly boring. Can you go do something about it? And, and they and they came up with an idea which, which I thought was fantastic, and they they almost died uh, at me thinking great. But anyhow, the, the structure one one building which was tilted, the Virendi, which is a bridge structure, which is uh, sandwiched between the glass faces. This is the Virendale uh, beam, which kind of is sandwiched between these glass blocks. So you enter underneath it because there's no structure. And if you cut a section through this building, literally <coughs> it seems as if it's floating above the ground. And therefore we began to look at how these other 
building it with land to kind of form a landscape of structure on the ground. And then we wanted to always transfer structures from above to below. So they, we decided they each almost land in a different kind of way. So one side of the building is almost invisible, the glass. This is the takeover on the Russians, my only takeover on the Russians, white on white. We went through this for one summer, white on white, black and black. Of course, they don't photograph and um, colorblind people have a problem with red on black too. The forest of columns, and they, therefore these kind of this, the, each slab would land in a slightly different way to kind of make this landscape, which as you enter the building, under this built space, which has no, 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 it's like a part of the forest which is being shaved away, you will see all these things next to you. Um, looking towards the harbor, the county delivered um, Grand deal. A study of how you enter the building through these kind of incisions on the ground which become uh, like, uh, uh, you know, permanent shadows. The glass room which becomes the entrance. And the layers of all these uh, slabs. A study of the entrance. So you move from the space uh, up to, the, to these, and as you enter the space above, you see these endless uh, floors, and you can see through all the kind of glass curtain wall. And then we went through the painful part of uh, trying to resolve the most important part of this building, which is to meet the building permit in Germany, which is the idea of the core and all the mechanical spaces, and to design all the meeting rooms. So there could be meeting rooms which are in the dark, in the middle, and meeting rooms on the side, where they are very light. And we began to look at the cores, and simultaneously with all these uh, spaces, we began to, they were first very fragmented through the building, and then at one point we decided to bring them together as if it's a kind of a highway uh, cutting through the building, so it's like one solid piece cutting through it. And we decided that there will, there will be kind of, uh, these solid cores next to each other, separated by these kind of very uh, slim gaps, but these gaps had to be permanent, so they kind of cut through the entire building. And so the composition of the, of these, uh, the composition of the towers, which are the, the kind of all the cores, versus the, the kind of the composition of all the uh, layers of the glass make uh, an, a world for this building. Studies of the curtain wall, and um, we fought a great deal to have a kind of floor to ceiling with no span roll panels. I know it's, this is all very practical, which I hate uh, saying, but it was, uh, this is the problem with practice. Um, you know, the smallest ridiculous victory is uh, the most idiotic one. Back to invisible. And there is stuff on there. I mean, you can't see it. It's, it's what we now we see it, now we don't. Try to explain that to the Germans. <laughs> now I see it, now I don't. I mean, it's true. I have a German guy in my office. It took me about like, two years to explain to him what that means. Now I see it, now I don't. <laughs> I was in Germany uh, for the millionth time, in East Germany, this weekend in Dessau. And um, as I landed, I had a press conference, and they asked me that, you know, I'm, I'm this most wonderful blah, blah, but I am the most awful person in the world. And on that note, I decided to really change and become excessively charming. I was about to, you know, blow my top at them. And after two days of my excessive charm, I thought, who will say you are so dreadful and rude? And, and it goes back to a guy who came to see me who was a very powerful journalist in Germany called Michael Moninger, who came to visit me in London two, um, five years ago, six years ago. And I was my last year of the A in 87, seven years ago. And he followed me around for five days in the office and watched my hand you know, and watched everybody's hand, and um, it was really a nightmare. And it was, at the time, I used to be rude to people, say, to all the Germans that they should not drink milk because it puts them to sleep. And I said, but that's ridiculous. You know, the whole of Germany is based on drinking milk. 
and, and ask the things like that. And don't drink yogurt, puts to sleep. This guy followed me around for four days, finally came to see Alvin to ask him questions. And he decided to come to my jury. Well, he was sitting in the back here. My jury was in this room, which uh, I insisted on, um, because I thought that they, they, all the rooms are, are awful. Um, so I said, I would only have it here. So I had it here. He sat in my jury for a whole day. At 5 o'clock in the evening, he asked Alvin, who are these people presenting? And Alvin almost committed suicide on the spot because he did not realize they were my students. Anyway, hence, this guy has become a very powerful writer and, and maybe wiser. So he realized that I had, he had driven me up the wall. And there was one point, after five days of explaining all these things to him, he said to me, well, isn't it strange uh, that you are you know, an Arab and so successful. And how did you get here? I said, by aeroplane. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then he really had this idea that I kind of have all my life lived in a tent tent in some, you know, um, sand place and came here by kind of osmosis, by some accident, by a fluke. And this was not a joke, it was absolutely true. And um, so anyway. To, to now, you see it now, you don't, sorry. A study of the back elevation uh, of all the, you know, the slits in the back wall. And you'll see how the, the ground begins to really uh, kind of lift gently towards the front. So you have nothing on the, on the there's no floor on the front. And the cut, the cut in the two walls, the one building, which as it cuts through it, it breaks, and as it breaks, the, the, the ground, this thing is inside the ground, which becomes the plaza, and that's how you enter the side, and that's how you enter uh, the harbor. Becomes, it kind of also coincides with an existing street, which has a kind of bicycle path, so you can go straight into the harbor. Lighting coming through the, the scut in the earth uh, at night. And then endless studies about how, what, are this, what is the elevation like of these two buildings. There was one, because this, the demand from the city, the client, that they have to have what they call a media center, there was this thing called the, the black box, which was um, a kind of a recording studio, and this was suspended in the, in the block B in a glass, in the glass building. And this black box, had no home, really. It was a kind of an orphaned uh, per, uh, box uh, because they couldn't really do this uh, space. So it kind of shifted around trying to find a home for itself. So again, the plaza, which kind of is over the water, is kind of uh, cut. It's a made of clogger, but it's cut with, with some light in it. And the idea that these roofs become all uh, uh, kind of uh, like a relief of the ground and becomes used uh, as a kind of a landscape for the buildings opposite uh, inside. They can see it because they're all tilted and they become terraces for the space above, below. A study about what are all these roofscapes which become, become light. And then at some point in time, we saw that it's really kind of like almost the pressure of the water uh, that build the beginning, the building begins to kind of lift up and then also change it one more time. The, the change occurred in, as in the idea of the landscape that it's no longer to do with kind of making a, a shrubbery and so on, but the landscape becomes these kind of very gentle reliefs, which are different surfaces on the ground. So these become either balustrades or different spaces. They begin to lift up or drop down. And they, the street condition, how these become like steps towards the entrance of the building. The hard surfaces versus the soft surfaces. The riveting of the plaza. Drawings which Brian do, does, which no, I don't I know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> and he does. I'm sorry, Brian, I had to say this because I've tortured myself for a year looking at this drawing. I, I have to say, you know, th there was a fantastic team which went on this building and and um, this, uh, this shows this one of these drawings which has many, many stories in it. Uh, it shows the building in context. It shows the, the kind of the block uh, A reflected uh, on the in the water. 
Uh, the street uh, side with the kind of cantilever, verandial uh, structure, the, the, the transparent spaces, and then the whole of the city and how you can look at this from below, above, in context and adjacency, not in transparency, and how you would use this building as you move through it. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>